Welcome back to Metro Exodus. In the last episode, we left the Caspian Sea after getting some water and gasoline and all the things we needed to get our train up and going again. And now we're just, I was going to say on the road, but you know, uh, on the tracks? In between destinations? Let's go see what the plan is and see how everybody's doing. Seems like it's very hot outside. Oh, right. The radio. I get to do this so infrequently. Every time I see it again, it's like, oh yeah, there's a radio. I can scan through it. Hear interesting things. What is that? Weird, it's not like it's a Morse code or anything, it's way too slow. And there's no patterns to it as far as I can see. Sounds like, it sounds kind of like somebody's dialing a phone and nobody's picking up. Oh, and now it's returning to that same noise as well. I guess that's like the noise of a blank channel? All the other ones sound like static, though. So it's like an established communication channel somehow that's putting out this noise every once in a while, but it's, you know, nobody's just really actively using it. Детали надо лично обговорить. Серьезные дела любят тишину. 
А тут нас хоть и не должны подслушать. Да, понимаю. Завтра у развалина ресторана. Пойдет? Пойдет. Значит, завтра, Аббас. Конец связи. Ракмет, брат. Конец связи. One of them said by the holy flame, so I assume they're the Baron's people? Oh, Gil! Hope that goes well. Okay, so I think I should probably read every single thing that I want to read here, because I only get to read this when I'm on the train in between places, which happens once every, like, 10 or 20 hours, it feels like. I don't think I want to read any of the weapon stuff, probably. I don't know, let's read one, like the Bulldog. That's my new assault rifle, that seems to be incredible. The Bulldog didn't really have a chance to make a name for itself in the numerous wars mankind was so fond of waging before the apocalypse. The weapons creators intended it to replace its ancestor, the venerable Kalash. Yet mankind was able to neatly wrap its history up without the newcomer's involvement. So the Bulldog started reaping its share of lives only after the end of the world. I have to give the Bulldog's designers credit, it is vastly superior to Kalash in damage output, handling, accuracy. Has a lower rate of fire, making bursts more controllable, and is much lighter to boot. Yet, despite all that, you don't really see these weapons often. The Bulldog is much more complex than Kalash and requires skillful maintenance. It's hardly surprising that most of the survivors prefer its elder brother, the indestructible Kalash. Well, I don't mind maintaining this thing at all, it's practically sniper accurate. Any equipment stuff I want to read? Not really. Any new creatures I want to read? Don't think so. Cannibals, Svarag oil. What is Svarag oil? The criminal empire ruling the portion of Caspian Desert we visited was controlled by a supreme ruler called the Baron. Using the largest oil rig in the area as his seat of power, Apparently, the Baron's climb to power started within Svarog Oil, an oil drilling company that had been controlling all of oil extraction in the area when the war broke out. Oh. Well, the biggest thing I want to see is the diary and especially the crew. I think we've... we see all this stuff on the loading screens, right? Yeah, we saw this diary entry when we loaded into this place in the last episode. But the crew... I want to read everybody's and all the new stuff that's been added to the ones that I've already read. So there should be some new stuff with Anna. I've read hers, right? Yeah. What's, what's new? I'm not exactly sure where I left off last time, but let's pick up with the whole Yamantau bunker thing. I've always been telling Anna that her father is holding on to a stupid fabrication and completely disregarding reality, but she loves him too much to fully admit that. There was no trace of government in the bunker complex under Yamantau Mountain, which the colonel was so eager to reach. 
just deranged cannibals who were once workers and soldiers but lost their humanity completely. Anna was captured by them and I barely managed to rescue her in the nick of time. She was furious, shouting at her father, who could not believe that the war was long since over, but already seems to have forgiven him. I sincerely hope that with the maps we recovered in the Caspian Desert, she will finally manage to persuade her father that we can forget about the war and finally settle somewhere. It's time we found a new home, where Anna and I could finally live like a proper family is supposed to. Did we ever read Colonel Miller's? I don't think we did. Miller, Colonel, oh, this is gonna be, oh wow, this is gonna be real hard to pronounce. Miller, Colonel Sviatslav Konstantinovich Melnikov, the founder and the permanent commander of the Order of Sparta. Miller picked and trained each Spartan individually. He was the only one to come to the rescue of my home station when we were under attack by the Dark Ones. He was the only one to stand between the communists and the Nazis and prevent the conflict which could well spell the ultimate end of our civilization. It was Miller who accepted me into the order and blessed our union with Anna, his only daughter. I became his son-in-law but could never amass the courage to call him dad. Nothing but Colonel with a Sir, of course. In the D6 defense, the Colonel lost his best fighters and his old self. Something is forever broken in him. He became cold, completely intolerant of any dissent. Sometimes I feel he's sorry he didn't object to his daughter marrying me. He would have probably preferred Hunter as his in-law. But Hunter is missing, and I dragged his daughter into a maelstrom none of us might ever emerge from. I dragged the Colonel into the worst adventure of his life. He had to commit high treason to save his daughter with me in tow. He's convinced that the war is still going on, that Moscow had to fake death to prevent the final murderous strike from being launched against it. But Anna is still his daughter, and I am still one of his soldiers. So he, in his advanced age, risks everything he has, his reputation, his position in the metro, the most of his order, everything to save us two and maybe somehow get himself out of this mess. We're going to the Yamantau Mountain, where the Supreme Command HQ is located. Only the true government of our destroyed country could now pardon the Colonel for treason. Of course, if they agree to even listen to him at all. There's one problem, though. It's been a few days since we left Moscow, but we have yet to find a trace of the occupying forces. The Amantel Bunker was a huge disappointment for each of us. <laughs> that, that's such an understatement. Yes, got captured and almost eaten by cannibals. It was a disappointment. Oh, I thought it'd be so much better. Most unpleasant. But for the Colonel, what we found there was a total catastrophe. Not only was there no Supreme Commander, there looked like there was none left at all. So the people in control of the Metro would have no superior in this world. Which meant there was no chance for the Colonel to be pardoned for treason and never return to Moscow. Not only would he have to spend the rest of his years in exile, an old cripple in charge uh, of a few deserters instead of the esteemed commander of the order he used to be, it appeared that all his life, all his battles in the metro were useless. There were no signs of the war still going on, so back in Moscow, our indomitable colonel simply helped a bunch of usurpers deceive the whole population of the metro, even though he was kept out of the loop. How could he take this blow and not crumble going back? to commanding us again. I might hate his hard-headedness and blindness, yet I can't help but admire his self-control and courage. Even in the Caspian Desert, where most of our people were down with dehydration, the colonel persevered to continue coordinating operations, issuing orders, and even gave his share of water to the soldiers while continuing to search for redemption. There and then, Miller finally accepted the fact that the war was long over and there were no occupying forces. He even seemed to accept the fact that his days of glory were over with. Um, were over with only quiet sunset years in some backwater ahead. The only thing he wouldn't accept, no matter what, was the danger his daughter's life was in. Was in. Outliving Anna was the most terrifying prospect he had ever faced. Demir. 
I don't think I've read theirs either. But yeah, we spent a bit of time with Demir. They were the one that we uh, stole the truck full of water with. We jumped onto the top of the truck that they were driving. Demir is probably the calmest of all the crew members. Demir is also extremely reliable. He'll always be there to help. He always does the hardest part of any job. Goes on the toughest missions. And then, instead of taking the well-earned respect and gratitude as one would expect, he starts blushing and saying he had nothing to do with success. And it all just kind of happened that way. There's only one painful issue for Demir, and that's his name given to him by his father, along with half of his blood. Demir can't forgive his father for leaving, going as far as to deny being his blood kin. Yet, having discovered the state that people sharing half of his blood were in, in the shores of the dried up sea, Demir changed. He did everything in his power to set them free, but eventually it was time to live. Besides the blood of his father's ancient nomadic people, there's Spartan blood in Demir's veins and its call proved stronger. I think when it says eventually it was time to live, I think that is supposed to say leave? Right? Because it's saying like despite the blood and, and their connection and desire to help the people at the Caspian Sea, all the slaves, um, they, the, the calling of being a, a Spartan was stronger than the calling of their people. So yeah, that's supposed to be... Eventually, it was time to leave. Duke. Duke of Darkness. Igor Dukov, the youngest, the bravest, and the craziest of us. Some join the order out of desperation, others to protect people from dangers, but Duke is just desperately in love with adventure. Whenever the Colonel asks for volunteers, Duke is always first to shout, Me! No matter how hard and dangerous the mission ahead may be. A shame we don't have any medals in the order, otherwise Duke would be plastered with them. He keeps looking up to the more experienced fighters, competing with them for the most kills, missions, and wounds. For some reason he pays particular attention to comparing his achievements with mine. Perhaps it's because I'm closest to his age. And I once said about him, quit your whining, Artyom. There are people here who dream of becoming like you are about Duke? Was she right? Igor likes being called the Duke of Darkness, but you can hardly find a lighter-hearted guy. He is but a brat talking, cr talking, taking crazy risks all the time, but Lady Lux smiles to the brave. If not for the trick he played on Salantius, that old obscurant, our whole operation could have failed. Duke, my friend, your star is undoubtedly on the rise, and soon you'll outshine us all. We be of one blood, ye and I, and I'm proud of it. I think I mentioned this before, but my reading of these, uh, these crew dossiers or biographies or whatever you want to call them, it's a little bit awkward because it's really hard to see where the periods and the commas are, and also the grammar and spelling is very bad, <laughs> so I have to do a lot of like auto correcting, and even the text is just outright blurry, which is really weird, because this game is so beautiful in most ways, but this whole journal thing just doesn't look good. It's not very readable. Okay, I've got a bit of a headcanon here. Uh, for some reason, he pays particular attention to comparing his achievements with mine. Perhaps it's because I'm closest to his age. No, in my headcanon, Duke is gay for Artyom. Yermak. Hmm. I don't think there's anything new here, actually. It doesn't mention the Yamantel bunker or anything like that. Next. Idiot. I don't think we've read theirs. Idiot chose his nickname out of natural humility, or perhaps simply in honor of one of uh, Dostoyevsky's Dostoyev characters. In fact, he's anything but being the most educated and well-read soldier in the Order, landing the position of Miller's right-hand man back in the Metro. The question is, what does he really know about the reasons for people being held in the tunnels? The war that could be still be going on as well as who's really in control of the Metro. Idiot likes talking a lot, but he never actually says much, even if you push him. Say for his usual, on one hand this could be true, while on the other... If you feel that the truth is close enough to touch, talk to Idiot. He'll confuse you completely in no time. One thing about him is that, that I don't understand at all is what could he even be looking for fighting in the Order's ranks? In combat, though, Idiot becomes a different man. 
There's not a trace of his usual penchant for long-winded speeches and reflection. He is composed, quick, and ruthless. It was him and Sam who saved us from the cannibals in the Yamantau bunker. The Yamantau bunker complex. And it was him again who interpreted the satellite data and gave us a new goal. The more the colonel glares at me, the more he relies on him. So I think that whenever our leader decides to retire, he's most likely to leave the order, or whatever's left of it by that time, in idiot's hands. I love that the sun rays coming from outside are actually being cast on the journal and moving around. It's really nice. Alyosha. Alyosha, the life of every party, an avid lady killer, favorite customer of the seediest joints of Svetnoy Boulevard, and our survival on the surface instructor? What? After only a cursory glance, you can correctly tell if an abandoned building can last for years or is ready to collapse onto your head at the lightest touch. Which ability saved him back in Moscow more than once. Alyosha is the only member of our crew seemingly taking our journey for an exciting adventure. Probably in anticipation of new meetings with representatives of the fair sex, of course. Sam, I know that we read theirs. Let's see if anything new has been added. No, nothing new in Sam's. Stepan, I don't think we ever read theirs. In day-to-day -day life, Stepan is so calm and nice, it's hard to believe he's a member of the Order. We're a military organization, after all. Once you see this giant in battle, though, you immediately see the reason for him being here. Stepan is completely fearless and amazingly strong. He handles a heavy machine gun as if it were a regular assault rifle. We're lucky to be on Stepan's side. Having him as an enemy would be a disaster. Right until meeting Katya, Stepan has never defied the colonel. But when Miller didn't want to let the woman and her daughter board the Aurora, he started a real quarrel. The colonel was noticeably thrown off, while the rest of us immediately understood what was going on. Still, as any good commander, Miller quickly saw through Stepan and let himself and let himself being talked into letting Katya and Nastya aboard. With this addition, Stepan was sure to never leave the crew. For saving her, Katya repaid Stepan in kind in the Caspian Desert. Stepan got so ill he couldn't even walk, much less fight. He almost died from dehydration. And if not for Katya, he would have been dead for sure. He knew whom to thank for his life. And as soon as he was able to get up, he immediately fell to one knee and proposed. Search wherever you can, you'd never find a better husband for Katya and stepfather for Nastya. He's been spending so much time with the girl, making toys for her and answering her constant questions about everything that Nastya had already called Stepan dad several times by that time. Now that Katya was officially his wife, beholding their family happiness was a true sight for the sore eyes. At least someone will be able to have a proper family in future. A pity, this doesn't seem likely for Anna and me. Uh, yeah, we've already read this, and there's nothing new. Katya and Nastya. We've read part of this, but these two last paragraphs are new. Katya really is amazing. If not for her efforts, our crew was bound to stay forever in the Caspian Sands. We survived in the Metro Tunnels. We won the Battle of D6. We survived where nobody else, uh, where anybody else would die. But dehydration and infections of the desert had almost done us in. Stepan, despite all of his strength and resilience, would have definitely died there had Katya not nursed him back to health. It seems she would have never forgiven herself had she not been able to. Katya herself, however, she suffered from the heat. Never let that show. Driven by her example, Nastya not only didn't whine in the slightest, but did her best to help her mother tend to the sick. What in the world would we have done without them? And finally, we have Crest. We've already read that. Looks like that's everything I wanted to see in the diary. I feel like I might only get to... Actually, I feel like this might be the last time I get to read the, the diary. Okay. Well, I feel like this is a pretty good place to end the episode. I started the episode here. And I ended the episode here. So, I hope you've enjoyed so far. <laughs> uh, I, I am actually ending the episode, by the way, because that did take quite a while. I'm glad I did it. I'm, 
I love reading stuff like that. But I do find it funny that I basically... I mean, I literally stayed in one tiny room the entire episode. <laughs> so I hope you've enjoyed so far, and in the next episode, I'm going to take a couple steps outside the door.